All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to YSA Virtual Online Experiences. Uh, it was chilly yesterday, but it's back to a, a sunny day today. And with summer just around the corner, uh, I thought it would be a great idea to invite Mr. Steve Paff from the National Weather Service. Um, you are the, what's your title, Steve? You are the chief meteorologist? No, no chief. I'm one of the, in, one of the Indians. I'm, I'm warning coordination meteorologist. Excellent. Yes. And your, your background, you have a Bachelor of Science in Atmospheric. Yes, Atmospheric Science from Kane University in New Jersey. And before I joined the Weather Service 25 years ago, I actually uh, worked with Al Roker for a little bit at uh, NBC News in New York. Oh, cool. graphics and uh, so it's been a lot of fun it's been a fun ride how is Al I, I think he just looks like a super guy yeah he was extremely uh, nice person to work with really down to earth he he loved weather he, uh, he loved um, uh, animations and cartoon type things too so he was he's he's a great person yeah yeah uh, what are the I, I love watching WECT here the the, the folks here that it's a really great local team, though. So you work a lot with them, and yeah. In fact, all of our local media partners are fantastic, yeah. uh, including the ones in Myrtle Beach I work with. So I work with some in Raleigh, Wilmington, and the Myrtle Beach area. Yeah, great. Well, um, we have done a, a lot of sort of atmospheric climate change type of stuff at YSA. So we have a lot of budding young meteorologists and oceanographers amongst mm -hmm. us that have joined us today and in the virtual world. So yeah, with summer around the corner, we have lots of issues with, of course, hurricanes and, and things like that. So weather driven processes, but also when the weather gets warmer, everyone floods to the beach. And oh, yeah. yep. there are always issues with, you know, riptides and, and just general beach safety, which is all driven by the physics, right? Um, yeah, and some of the beaches are I'm hearing are starting to open up in a limited sense. So we're going to have more people uh, heading to uh, to escape their homes and relax a little bit. And you, we got to be mindful of the dangers. So it's not like swimming in a pool, which has its own set of dangers. And you know, the ocean is drastically different. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I'm I'm so excited to um, that you could join us today and tell us. Uh, about the science behind all of these things we were just talking about. And yeah, I'll, I'll pass it over to, to you. Okay, great. Uh, it's, it's good uh, to be here with everyone. I know we tried last week and we had some internet issues, which look really good. I think we're working now uh, from, from, from your end. I guess I can share my screen. Yep, and that should work. Hopefully you see a beach weather and safety graphic. Do you see that? Yeah, we got it. Yeah, it looks great. All right, now I'm gonna try and move some things around so that I can start the slides here. And, and I have some videos too. I don't know how laggy it's gonna be, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause when I can, which I know seems a little unnatural at, at times, but when you're waiting on, on technology, uh, you, you have to do what you, what you can. I'm just moving some things out of the way so I can see my screen here and, and 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 you're right you know we you know we we live in an area with with the beach which makes it beautiful but can make it dangerous if we're not careful from hurricanes to thunderstorms and rip currents and you know i'm really going to focus a lot on rip current safety i'm also going to talk about thunderstorm safety as well since it's the most common hazard that we have but right. you know a lot of times when you're working on projects for school or for fun or you know whatever uh, you're into, it's good to hear we have some some folks that might want to be oceanographers or meteorologists because we need people to manage healthy atmosphere, healthy oceans. We can't survive with without them. And you know it's it's, it's really important that when you work on projects, whether you're doing them now or you work on a project a year from now or when you're working when you're older, you're going to need observations. You're going to need to collect data. And it's so important that data can tell you so many important things. And it might not be a math calculation necessarily, but it could be something along the lines of rip currents um, impact a lot of people in North Carolina. Okay, well, what age group is the most at risk? What can we do to message information better 
to these various groups so that they can stay safe. And let me give you an example. With rip currents, we've looked at the uh, number of people that have uh, been killed by rip currents since 2000 in the Carolinas. And unfortunately, and it's very sad to say, the numbers show there are over 140 people since 2000 that have died from rip currents. When we look a little deeper into the, into the data, into the observations, we have found that 25% of those people that were killed by rip currents were the, was the person that was originally on the beach watching a person caught in a rip current and tried to make a rescue. So that you know, we can have all the messages in the world to someone who's caught in a rip current and tell them what to do to stay safe. But we've got to be able to tell people what to do if they see someone who's caught in a rip current. You know, lifeguards train for months on end to be able to do the job that they do and do it safely. And I think that's why we see such a drastic number in people that are bystanders, those that witness someone in a rip current go and try and make the rescue and, and pass away is because they're not trained on how to do so safely. So think in terms of you're, you're gathering observations, you're gathering data, but how important how you use the information can be and what hidden gems of information you can find from what you research. Uh, it, it could be quite fascinating at times. And I, Dr. Rob, I don't know if you, you, you agree or you've run into similar types of, of things like that where observations are critical, data is critical to what we do. Yeah, well, the, actually, the first thing I th first thing I thought of is the current situation with the coronavirus, mm -hmm. right? Where, yeah, a lot of parallels. Yeah, a, lo a lot of parallels where you have, you know, there is some information out of there that, you know, that you can use, but you have two mindsets, right? You have some people that think that it should be business as usual or with limited restrictions. And then there are some that's, you know, sort of towing the line and, thinks that, you know, we should. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and some decisions that are made on data aren't necessarily the ones we want to make, but we have to do it for the greater good of, of the communities that are out there. And it's no different with preparing for a hurricane. You, you know, I can talk all the time to them blue in the face. You, people have to do this or we're going to get caught off guard and have to do that. And you get people that will listen and will we'll do and will be prepared and will be ready you'll get those that'll do some of the work and be limited in what they're prepared for. And you get others that say, ah, it's just another Carolina storm, no big deal. Um, you know, I'll just wing it as it, as it goes. And you know, it's, it's with any data sets, you can get different conclusions, even though you might try and steer someone to what we should be doing. And when, when I went to school for meteorology, if I can go back and do it again, I think I would have got a dual degree. I would have got a degree in meteorology and also social science, human behavior because the message that we try and tell people, uh, seek shelter immediately, a tornado is coming, don't go in the water because there's dangerous rip currents, do this instead type of thing. Um, understanding why people behave the way they do is so important uh, to my profession now. I, that's, that's actually an interesting point of view because we talk a lot about careers and how do you prepare for careers. And I agree with you. I, I never took a social science thing in fact i never took a business this would be another thing i'd go back and take a business or accounting course and um often we, we sort of have the blinders on and we're heading you know right i'm going to be a meteorologist i need to take this 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 i'm qualified to go for it but there's so many sort of outside the box things and multidisciplinary things we need to think about to you know yeah we we, I, I, we need specialization in our education, but we also need a foundation that is very broad so we can understand and interact with a variety of partners. And these are partners that I never thought of I would have had 20 years ago, if you would have asked me, uh, from even the Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, to emergency managers, to university professionals and, and researchers and scientists and homeowners associations. It's just amazing how, who I get to interact with, lifeguards. It's, it's amazing who I get to interact with uh, throughout the course of a year. All right. We ready to get in and learn some things here. Very informal. Oh, yes. uh, Dr. Rob will, will coordinate any, any questions that, uh, that you may have. I think a good way to handle the questions maybe is, you know, if I talk about lightning safety, 
maybe wait till I'm done talking about the lightning part and then maybe we can take a pause and see if there are any questions and do it that way versus, because I, I might cover something, the question that you have, uh, you know, when I get through these individual sections, but I, so we're going to talk about beach weather, safety, thunderstorms, show some videos. Uh, I'm going to quiz you on uh, you guys helping me find where the rip currents are and some pictures I'm going to show you. I want you really to do your best to learn as much as you can because the information that you, you learn might not only help you save your life one day, but of a family member or a friend. You know, education and knowledge is extremely powerful. No one can take that away from you. And every little tidbit of information you learn makes you more powerful uh, for, the, for our communities and for our families and for our friends. So, you know, I, I really mean that you guys can all take, take information and make a difference no matter how old you are. And I hope that that carries on with you for the rest of your lives. Yes, and I will call on people too, Steve. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's see. Just a little bit of logistics with our dogs. You might have heard them barking already because I got people working around the house and they get a little excited. But you might hear Ellie, Remy, and Zoe, the, the three rescue dogs that we have. So just I hope they, they stay quiet, but... At least you know what they look like if you hear them hear them barking. Ellie up top is the oldest. Remy there in the middle, uh, the brown dog. She's the youngest. She just had her birthday yesterday. She's four. Oh, uh, Ellie is six, and Zoe is five. And it's amazing they all act a different. Zoe acts more like a human being. Uh, Remy and Ellie act more like dogs. So it's kind of interesting. This, this, so <laughs> now you know when you when you hear them uh, barking, which I'm sure will will happen. Okay, so what I really want to talk about, and really focus on lightning safety, we'll talk about wave types and what that means to waves as they come into the surf zone where the waves break, because there's another type of hazard associated with the type of breaking wave that comes in uh, that I want you to learn about. And then of course, rip currents we will go through. So uh, first little thing I want you to think about, and this is a time lapse and hopefully you see it, it uh, moving on your screen. Dr. Rob, is it moving? Yeah, yeah it looks great. Okay. Great. So it, this is a rotating thunderstorm. This is called the mesocyclone. And this is all it means is there's, there's an updraft within the thunderstorm that as it's moving upward, it's spinning like a top or like um, uh, a, a cork or something like that where it's, it's spinning around. And that just tells us that it's got rotation and can produce a tornado. And these are similar types of storms that we had last Monday in parts of my area that caused six tornadoes to occur. With these supercells, these rotating updrafts, you can have, uh, well, with every thunderstorm, we have lightning, uh, but this one could have produced a tornado. If it doesn't move and rains over the same spot for a long period of time, can lead to flooding. It can produce microbursts, which are like big bowling balls of wind and rain that descend from the thunderstorm cloud and bring down strong winds from the upper parts of the storm. We had that in part of our area where we had 80 to 110 mile per hour winds and it wasn't a tornado, it was microbursts from intense weather. So hail is the other one. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking on some of these, but I really want to focus on the lightning one because that is the most common of these. Now, what do you think is the deadliest of these five thunderstorm hazards? Kills more people around the country every year consistently if you had to had to guess. I don't know if anybody wants to take a take a guess. Ooh, this is a good question. Well, I have a hunch, but let's see. What what is uh, what do you guys think? Adeline, do you want to have a go? I like have no idea because they all look pretty deadly. Yeah, he, they, Adeline's right. They are all deadly. All right, uh, I'm going to take a stab. Is it the one with the cars, the flooding? Yes, flooding. And the, the, uh, the thinking behind that is that people don't realize the power of flowing water. Or when you have flooding at night, if it ro washes away part of the road, the dangers are very, very hard to recognize. Uh, you can have a, a car that's pushed off a roadway and down on a, an adjacent creek, and, and then the car submerges. Or a car can be going over a road that is being undermined by the water and collapses it and then gets pushed down uh, the, the, the flowing water that's going. So we, that, that is the deadliest of the hazards. So lightning is the most common. Flooding is the deadliest. 
Hail is the costliest of these. And of course, microburst and tornadoes, um, you know, they, they do their own destruction like we saw back on, on Monday in, in parts of Pender County and, and uh, Brunswick County, Columbus County, and, and other parts in the South Carolina. Uh, it, was, it was terrible thunderstorms that we had. So we'll, we'll talk about several of these. We'll talk about the most common first, lightning. And these bolts of lightning you see striking the ocean, these are called ribbon bolts or ribbon lightning. There's forked lightning that you can get in cloud to cloud uh, or in cloud and usually in the tops of the thunderstorms. But these are the ones we're really worried about coming down. They, they impact the sea surface or hit land. They're five times hotter than the surface of the sun and there's millions of volts of electricity with these. And I'm telling you right now that you don't need me or another meteorologist to tell you that there's danger if you can hear thunder. So that's why we have this rule of thumb, when thunder roars, go indoors. There's two safe places you can go. One is inside a four-walled building. And let's give an example of that. If you're in a garage and the garage door is down, that would count as a four-walled building. If the garage door is up and you're looking out at the storm because you're amazed by it and the, the wonder and awe of the storm like we all love to do, you are in a dangerous situation. You're not in a four-walled building. The four-walled building creates an eggshell around you so that if lightning hits that building, it'll be directed through the walls and around, uh, keeping you much safer situation. The other place that's safe is inside a car. And it's not because of the tires necessarily. It's because the metal chassis, so this is a metal top car, not a convertible. The metal top car keeps, uh, that, that metal chassis around you keeps you like in an eggshell, uh, keeps you protected. And then the tires are help, help keep you grounded. And we'll talk more about, about them a, a, little, a little bit because I want to talk about some myths that are, very, that are very important. The other thing you don't want to forget is wait 30 minutes until that last rumble of thunder before going back outside. Give time for the storms to clear the area. We have statistics that show most people are struck by lightning in the window 15 minutes before the storm arrives to the window 15, 20 minutes after the storm exits. So that tells me two things. Remember, we talk about data and why it's important to learn from data when you look at it. It tells me that people are too patient as the storm is approaching, they want to get that last cast in fishing. They want to get that last round of golf and let finish up what they're, what you're doing, working on around the house. And it also tells me people are too impatient as the storm is leaving the area. So they need to be seeking shelter sooner and they need to be waiting until the storm's clear much more than what they currently are. We're going to see these numbers continue because not all lightning strikes occur with a thunderstorm directly overhead with the rain and the hail falling in your house. There's about 10% of them. So one out of 10 can travel a, a distance away from where the, uh, the thunderstorm is sitting, uh, sitting over a location that you see on radar or when you're looking outside. All right, so let's talk about, talk about some of these myths. The number one myth that I hear is lightning is attracted to metal. And I used to think that it was when I was younger, I didn't know any better. And then of course you learn more about meteorology. Lightning's not attracted to metal. Lightning is attracted to tall objects relative to its surrounding. Lightning is extremely lazy. It wants to get it from the sky down to the ground as efficiently as it can. It could be a metal object like the backstop here uh, uh, in these, these power poles, in the picture in the top left, but it can also be a tree, it could be a plastic golf tee, it could be a fiberglass fishing pole, it could be a human being if you're out on the field because we don't want to be the tall object, which is why we go into a four-walled building or into a metal top car because we don't want to be near a tall object and we don't want to be the tall object. And you can see even that, that picture in the top right, you don't have to be exactly next to that tall object, in this case a golf tee, the lightning can hit, hit something, telephone pole or a tree, travel down it, get into the ground, follow the roots or water that might be under the ground, and then get back up into your feet. So we got to stay away a considerable distance from these tall objects. Yeah, that's crazy. So if I'm looking at this picture right, he's on a putting green, and yep. those marks on the ground, that's from the lightning strike. Yeah, hit, hit the tee, travel down the tee, and found a way through the ground 
and the, the, the burn marks that you see are where the bulk of the electrical current went with it. Yep. And I would not want to be standing on one of those because it's going to go right up into your feet. Oh, absolutely not. That's, yeah. that, that's crazy. And a lot of people, like with that tree picture, it's disturbing to me because when it rains, if there is no building around, it, they, might be, they might be at a park or something like that. They get under a tree, and basically they're, they're under a tree where it's traveling down the trunk. It might go through the roots and up into your feet, or the side flash might come out of the trunk if you're standing next to it and, and get you that way. So it's just very important. Stay away from tall objects. Don't be the tall object. Go into a four-walled building or a metal top car. Let's, let's look at some of the other ones here. Here's a great picture on the left where lightning is falling in the area of rain that's coming out of the, the thunderstorm. And a lot of people think that lightning only strikes directly underneath that, and that's not the case. And as you can see from this picture on the right, you have the cumulonimbus cloud where the strike is coming from, and that lightning is carrying uh, farther, much farther downstream into an area where it's sunny and there's no rain and then strikes the ground. There's no rhyme or reason as to where it occurs, uh, but we can't let our guard down when thunderstorms are in the vicinity. And this is a perfect example as, as to why. So again, you're in danger if you're not in a safe spot and you can hear thunder. All right, here's, here's a good one. This is a myth and it's true. It's, it's, it's both. And I'll show you ways where it works and where ways where it doesn't work. So tires on a car or something that you're riding on can protect you from, from lightning. Now, if you are parked next to a tree or a telephone pole and lightning strikes that telephone pole, travels down the pole, gets into the ground and tries to get into your car, that's where the rubber tires insulate that from trying to get back in into the car if you're nearby. The other thing is if, let's say the radio antenna on the car gets struck by lightning and then it travels through the chassis of the car and now you're grounded by the tires but it, it, it doesn't keep you safe. If you're riding a bike, you're on rubber tires. If you're on a motorcycle, you're on rubber tires. If you're in a convertible, you're driving with, with rubber tires. But if it hits you on the, on the head or on the shoulder or on another part of the bike, it doesn't matter if there's rubber tires or not, you're gonna be in a great deal of danger. Now here's a convertible that got hit by, by lightning. I don't know what happened to the people inside that. I'm hoping there weren't people in that because if there were, uh, it might not have been a good situation. So the, again, stay indoors when thunder roars is the, the simple message that you need to remember. Here's another one. I mean, on, you know, we got to talk about the realities of life here. Um, a lot of people think you're hundred percent safe in a house and that's not true. Um, you're, you've significantly lowered your risk of getting struck by lightning when you're inside. But now you got to think in terms of if I'm in a house, Am I connected to anything electrical or with the plumbing during a thunderstorm? Because if I am, I need to stop doing that. And let me give you a couple examples. If you're doing the dishes and water is running across out of the, out of the faucet, across your hands and into the drain and lightning hits your house and finds its way into the plumbing, then you are at risk because you are part of the plumbing as you're doing the dishes. Or if you're taking a shower, you're under the, 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 the head of the shower where water's coming out, you're part of the plumbing. As far as connected to electrical, the great example I can give you is if you are connected to the house's electrical by maybe the laptop that you're on right now. If you're on a laptop right now and it's plugged into the wall, you are connected to your house's electrical circuitry in a sense. And if lightning hits the house, then it can get into the electrical circuits and then in through the wire that's connected to the wall and the laptop and into your hands on the keyboard. If you disconnect the laptop from the wall charger and you're using it wirelessly, you're not at any danger. If you're playing a PlayStation or an Xbox and your, your, wire con your wireless controller is plugged to the console because you wanna charge it, you're part of the house's electrical uh, hookup. And if you've disconnected the wireless controller, then you're not connected to it. So you got to think in terms of, am I connected to the house's electrical or plumbing? And if you're not, you've significantly lowered the risk of danger being in a house, even if it does get struck. Now remember, lightning is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So if your house might have been struck by lightning and you smell smoke, you've got to call 911 because there, there might be a fire as a result 
of the lightning strike. 5,000 times hotter than the surface of the sun. We've got to make sure uh, we don't uh, have a house fire or structural fire, and that happens a lot in the summertime. Just be mindful of it. There's going to be a lot of close lightning strikes, but we've got to be um, uh, mindful of if we start smelling smoke and there's a fire. Oh, there go, there go my dogs. You can hear them, I'm sure. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you can't win. <laughs> no, it's great. All right, there, there's a picture showing a house fire. Again, I'm not trying to, to scare you. I just want you to be prepared and know what to do to take action so you can keep safe, your family stays safe. And it, it's, it's, you know, even, even as a kid, I was frightened of, of lightning and thunder until I realized what thunder was. Sure, it, it comes out of the blue and can scare you quickly. But if you understand why we have thunder, then it, it's, it's not, as, not as frightening. So when you have a lightning strike occur, like the one in the top right picture or the top left or, or any of these, that channel that the lightning has created through the atmosphere is actually separating the air. And then once the charge is done and it's, and it's uh, used itself up, then that air collapses back on itself. So you have all that air collapsing back on itself. And I, I know my hand isn't, isn't doing it justice, but that's the sound that we're hearing. You know, the, the lightning, lightning occurs, separates the air. And and then when it comes collapsing back on itself, that's what we're hearing. And for every, every five seconds from seeing the flash of lightning to hearing the thunder, because light travels faster than sound, it's about a mile away. So if I see a flash of lightning, five seconds later, I hear the rumble, that lightning strike was about a mile away. So if it's 10 seconds, then it's two miles away. So it's, it's pretty simple math uh, you, can, you can do to see where the the lightning strikes um, are. A really cool website that I just found out about is called lightningmaps.org. And next time there's thunderstorms in the area, uh, go to that webpage and you can see almost near real time on the map where the lightning strikes are showing up. And it's, it's just a pretty cool site if you're interested in, in meteorology and thunderstorms in, in particular. That, that's cool. And we might, we'll, we can look at that and um, I can put that link into the, into the, when I post this on the website. Yeah, that, that'd be great. And you can, you can observe thunderstorms around the world from this website, but it's really cool when you, when you're, you hear the thunder because the map, when you zoom in close enough, it actually sh shows rings uh, emanating out from the lightning strike when you're supposed to hear the thunder. And it's pretty close. It's pretty yeah. good. It's, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it, it gives you an idea where you're hearing the thunder from, from the individual lightning strikes. But can I ask a question about the, like before the lightning happens, um, it's basically, is it a, just a buildup of the static electricity inside of the cloud? Yes, you have, in the top of the cloud, you get ice crystals that are, are yep. it's like taking a balloon and rub it on your head. My hair doesn't stand up anymore as you, as you can see, <laughs> well, but if you take a balloon and rub it on your head, you might feel the static, uh, but, you're, but that rubbing creates the, the charge and just like water droplets or hail or ice crystals in the cloud, it's creating a charge, and if you get enough charge uh, in one part of the cloud to the other, you're gonna get the lightning strike to occur. And if the charge develops at the ground, maybe from wind rustling across an area and, and, and other things going on, uh, moisture, how it changes in certain areas and quick, it can quickly change, you can get that, that cloud to ground strike in, in yeah. that case. Yeah, we actually, last, last summer, one of our weather balloon launches ended up in a thunderstorm cloud and I was just amazed at the energy inside of that cloud system. You, you, yeah, we, yeah, I used to release balloons in the Corpus Christi office when I started there. And you'd be lucky if you get it for too long. That's how violent uh, those vertical motions can be, the, you know, the up and down motions can be within a thunderstorm. Or just yeah. I'll, I'll send you the video of, of this. It, it's, it's very, very impressive. Yeah, that, that'd be great. All right, this video, just to show you, you know, lightning uh, hitting the ocean surface, but it actually hits this wave here. A wave is a tall object relative to its surrounding. Salt water is um, a good conductor of electricity. So you might be walking here and you might actually feel it or get injured uh, if you were walking in this situation. Certainly if you were out body surfing or, or, or boogie boarding or whatever surfing out here, uh, you'd be in a bad situation as would any sea life in this general vicinity. Whoa. 
you fortunately see nobody's on the beach, so that's good. Here's a slow motion shot of it. The little blips you see on the screen are raindrops. That's, cr that's crazy. It's crazy. It's beautiful. It's frightening. Yeah. It's all of it wrapped up into one. Uh, very dangerous if we're not handling it the right way. A lightning strikes very similar to sprites that you see in high altitude areas. There, there's a lot of research that has to be done. I don't have any uh, pictures of sprites in this, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in determining, you know, why they occur, um, how they occur, those sorts of things. Are they an impact to anything? You know, maybe to, um, to aircraft if if they're yeah. in the right. You know, it, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done with that. All right, and this is a vehicle being struck by lightning. Everybody inside the car is fine, but the car got fried. You'll see it hits the antenna, travels through the chassis and out the tire, and blows up some asphalt. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. And they walked away from that, no? Yeah, they were fine. The car was fried. We, we keep records that go back decades of, of lightning-related fatalities. And, I didn't see the bolt. And there, haven't been, there hasn't been one that uh, has been killed inside a metal top car. That's super fast. Here, we'll do slow motion one more time. Oh, it happens, happens quick. This video, I I want you to, this video I want you to look at to see for what people were doing wrong in this. Get inside. So that side of the house got hit and it actually blew up some of the, the railing that you'll see here in a second. Look at that. Oh my goodness gracious. And then now watch what they do. Oh no, don't do it. Now we go inside. Nope. Yeah, they, they should have, uh, they should have been inside much. It's not worth a pretty picture. It's not worth the phenomenal video. No. Your life is worth more than that. Don't, don't, don't put yourself in a dangerous situation. So just real brief, hail is the costliest of the thunderstorm hazards. You can see damage to aircraft, to, to buildings, to cars, you name it. The larger the hail, uh, it could be considerable damage. You can also have uh, hail accumulate. There are parts in Texas when I was in Corpus Christi that we had a foot deep of quarter size hail. So it doesn't necessarily, the size, it could be the amount, the duration, what it impacts, crops, you can't move the crops out of the way. If, if a thunderstorm goes over the Charlotte airport and there's baseball size hail, you can't get all the aircraft out of the way. You can't get everybody's vehicles out of the way. So you can see how the cost of this adds up. Uh, roof damage, siding damage. The largest hailstone ever was almost 19 inches around. If you took a measurement around it, that's the circumference. It was almost uh, eight inches in diameter and weighed about two pounds. So that's just frightening uh, to have something like that and it happened in South Dakota. Once in a while, we'll get reports of softball size hail, maybe every 10, 15 years, uh, maybe every three years we get, three to five years we get, we get reports of baseball size hail. About every year we get quarter size to golf ball size hail somewhere in my office's area of responsibility. The severe weather hail season typically is in April, May and the first part of June. The severe weather microburst season usually peaks in June and July. So there's different types of severe weather. Again, look at the data. You'll, you'll find amazing things that, that stand out uh, compared to just looking at the whole set of information. Um, I think Adeline has a question. Yeah, sure. It might relate to lightning, but... Okay. How do people safely take the videos? Like, they're really close up. Yeah, they, that, that's a great question. And the only answer I have is they were extremely lucky that they were not victims in these, these videos. 
Now, the one of the car was from a, a dash cam in another car, so they were in a safe type of situation from lightning strikes, but those people outside didn't need to be doing that. Uh, the one from the beach, I think, was taken from a uh, beach rental property uh, right there in Daytona Beach, and I think they were inside, so that was, that was okay. But that's, right. a, that's a great question. And then Thanks. Cyrus has one um, as well. Okay. What was the most deadliest tornado that ever happened? There's been a lot of them. Uh, in the Carolinas, back in 1984, there were uh, multiple fatalities with the big tornadoes uh, near Red Springs, which is, you know, as you head inland and Bennettsville area. There have been some tornadoes that uh, the, the one in El Reno, Oklahoma, that killed two storm chasers. The Doppler radar that was uh, research on, it, it does, um, it's Doppler radar on wheels. They, they take it out in storm chase from a safe location. They deploy the radar and then they scan it. They actually scanned with the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado, I think 298 knots of wind. So you're talking over 300, 330 mile per hour winds uh, above the tree level, uh, just above the tree level in their, in their observations. And, and the, these tornadoes could be over a mile wide in some places. And, you know, fortunately, the tornadoes in the Carolinas usually aren't that big, but you get to the classic tornado out to this Oklahoma, Nebraska. Uh, it's just a, a breeding ground for big tornadoes, of which we'll, we'll talk about some in a little bit. Also, Bangladesh was really bad by that one EF5 tornado in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. We'll, we'll talk about tornadoes in a little bit. All right, flooding, real quick. You guys don't have your driver's licenses yet, but when you do get them, never drive through a flooded road. You don't know if the road is washed out or if it will collapse if your vehicle rides over it. Plus, you might misjudge a turn. This is down in Litchfield Beach, that picture in the top left, where they think they're driving into the parking lot of that business, turned too soon, and actually turned into the drainage ditch next to the side. And we can see cars making mistakes there, like the one here near the Home Depot on the lower left that drove into a, a drainage pond by accident. Never go near drainage ditches. If you, get, if you fall in and get swept into a drainage pipe, you could get pinned up against the grate there and, and it's not gonna be a good situation. So seek higher ground, don't drive through flooded areas is what I can say with, with flooding. And we're gonna skip that because we wanna get to the beach safety stuff more so. The microbursts, this is what I was saying uh, that can happen. It can cause strong winds, just like tornadoes. They can be very powerful. It's like a big bowling ball that descends from a thunderstorm cloud. It impacts the ground and fans out in a straight line from where it made impact. So you can get widespread swaths of wind damage. And some of that wind damage can get up to 100 miles per hour. When I went out um, to Wallace, South Carolina, uh, two days ago, from the damage that occurred on Monday, I found a swath of damage that was two to three miles wide and four to six miles long. So there were a couple microbursts that impacted there that could be dangerous. And anytime we have severe weather, when there's a potential for strong winds and a potential for tornadoes, we wanna know where our safe spot is in our house, that's the lowest floor, put as many walls between us and the outside walls, grab pillows from the couch if you have time and you stay low and cover your, your head so that you protect your head and you're doing the best you can to, to stay safe in these situations. And it, you'd be surprised, it can help a lot if you do the, do the right thing here. Here's a, a, a microburst, this is a little bit of a time lapse. You can see things are flying around rather quickly in the video, people walking fast and whatnot. So it's a time lapse of one, I think this was out in the desert southwest part of the country, you know, Arizona, New Mexico area, somewhere out there, and that just slams into the ground and you can have uh, widespread areas of damaging wind. So the updraft in the thunderstorm weakens. It can't hold up all the rain, all the hail that's up in the storm. And then it, it's sometimes like pulling a plug on the bottom of the storm. And once you do that, it lets these the, the strong winds come down to the surface and create the damage that we would have from something like this. All right, I'll show you this time lapse real quick. This is out in Tucson. You can see where the rain is falling here in the center part of the screen, you're gonna see a microburst or two drop from this part of the cloud. You'll see it here in a second. Watch, here it comes. And boom, slams into a ground. 
And then here's one here that slams into the ground, a couple of them, a series of microbursts going on. They're going to show you a little up close. So you might see it. And depending on your computer's resolution, it might be harder to see. But you see it right here coming down. And then boom, yep. that's slams wow. into the ground. Just as powerful as tornadoes. There's those vortices as well that look like they're spinning off when it hits the ground. Yeah, sometimes because it'll hit the ground, it'll, it'll fan out from where it hits the ground and you can get little, little vortices develop along that leading edge. And we actually call those gust nados. They're not classic tornadoes. A classic tornado like the one on this, this graphic here is in contact with the ground and the top of it is in contact with the thunderstorm cloud. You've got to have that connection to be an actual tornado. And, and this graphic just shows you that the, the, the tornado on the, the one next to Myrtle Beach, kind of like in the middle right, that's the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado that was over a mile across. You get intense damage within the funnel itself, but you can get damage outside of where we see the visible part of the funnel and some of these more intense. They call these wedge tornadoes because it looks like a giant wedge of the sky that's come down. Now, most of our tornadoes are these smaller ones that you see here, but can be very dangerous as a result. And this scale, the EF scale, is the enhanced Fujita scale. It goes from zero, the weakest, to five, the strongest. And you know, most of our tornadoes, fortunately, are of the EF zero, EF one. Just like Monday, uh, most of our tornadoes on Monday were EF one tornadoes, but still nothing to laugh at because you can have winds up to 100, 110 miles per hour with those EF, EF ones. And they're usually on the ground for about 10 minutes and about three to five miles or less is what we typically see. These big wedge tornadoes, the EF fours and fives, you're talking winds over 200 miles per hour. They can be on the ground for over an hour, over 50 miles. There was one that moved ashore near Tampa many years ago that crossed the entire peninsula of Florida and exited near the Melbourne area. Very, very powerful uh, these things can, can be. Oh, my one dog thinks she's a guard dog. All right, uh, let's, the uh, water spouts or tornadoes over the ocean. And we gotta make sure, we gotta be careful when we're at the beach, they don't move on shore. This guy changes the camera around a little bit and you, you kind of get dizzy, but they should not be there filming this. Uh, and then they get caught out on the beach uh, when it moves ashore and it's a dangerous situation, but luckily uh, they, were, they were okay. Most of our water spouts stay out over the ocean and most when they, if they do move on shore, most weaken within within a half mile of moving on shore. I, I remember seeing when I was down in Alabama during Deepwater Horizon oil spill, there would be water spouts in the Gulf, and yeah, being out in the water and just like, all right, let's let's get to safety. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not worth it as much as you want to view these things. You don't see them all the time. It's just not it's not worth it. We can't replace Dr. Rob or or Marsha or Cyrus or any of the others. I mean, we, we only got one of you and it ain't worth the, the picture. Safety always first. Now, thunderstorms that produce tornadoes, some of these tornadoes can be so powerful that it, it's hard to fathom what they can do. And this video is at Dallas, Fort Worth, where a tornado is going over a truck stop and it's actually picking up tractor trailers and just throwing them into the air like toys. Now look at that. That's crazy. Holy, wow. You'll see another one get lofted. That is power. We've got to respect that power. Got to know what to do instead of waiting until one threatens your area. So lowest floor of your house, put as many walls between you and the outside walls as possible. Most of us don't have basements because the water table is so shallow here. Uh, but here, this is our safe spot. Centermost room might be a closet, might be a bathroom, one with no uh, windows on it. It could be a closet. We need to need to stay as safe as possible. Never upstairs. If you have a two-story home, or you know, or your bedroom isn't a frog type of thing, a room over the garage, you you don't want to uh, stay in that upper floor. Always shelter lowest floor. All right. Any quick questions about tornadoes or lightning or microbursts before we move into the water side of things at the beach? Because this, I, I want to make sure we got enough time here. Uh, I want to finish up within the next uh, 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, let's, let's do the waves. 
Okay, excellent. All right. Well, waves form because of wind. Wind exerts a stress and a force across the wave. And if the force is intense enough and the waves get big enough, the circulation that you see showing up on that graphic can, can extend downward in the column. The, typically, your bigger, more powerful waves, when you're swimming in the ocean, you can feel it through uh, the, the entire uh, depth that you're, you're at. You might even see the sand moving around from the waves moving overhead. Now, the smaller waves, you're going to see a little motion at the bottom, and most of it will be up top. So it's, it's the wind that generates the waves. And the wind that generates waves locally, we call those wind waves. And the waves that move away from the area that they're generated, we call them swells. So here's wind waves that are, I mean, they can be big. They're usually choppy. And swells usually set themselves up in a nice organized fashion as they get away from the storm that's generating the, these waves. We can have, a, this, this is probably a case where there might be a storm one to two, 3,000 miles offshore that is so intense and the winds are so strong that it generates waves through swells that actually make it to our coastline. And that's one of the hazards we have with rip currents. We might have a big storm out there that's producing swells moving into our area that uh, rip currents love it when there's swells out there. That's what really gets them, gets them going. The water's piling into the beaches. The water can't continue to pile up at the beach. It's gotta find its way back out into the ocean. So what happens are breaks in the sandbars form and rip currents are able to develop in those areas because the water's flowing back out. It's like, a, it's like a cycle. You have waves coming in, you gotta have waves, you gotta have water going back out to stay in balance. So when we have a lot of big waves, there's more than likely a big chance of having rip currents out there. All right, three different wave types I want you to know about. One is the most common, and they're all varying sizes. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a bigger wave than what we typically would see in our in our part of, of the beach, but a spilling breaker. This is the most common. This is when you have the energy released as the wave breaks over a gradual period of time. And, and it, it doesn't feel too terribly rough when you have this type of wave out there, assuming there's not much wind and other waves that are going on with these. But these spilling breakers, as they, as they feel the bottom, as they get close to shore, the top of the wave begins to crest and just gently spills down the wave face. And this is a good one to surf on, in this case here, bodyboard or even do body surfing. Um, and fortunately for us, the most common is the, the gentlest of the waves. Another type of wave that's very rare for our area is when the whole wave kind of just pushes forward and forces its way up the beach from the base of the wave all the way up to the top of the wave. It doesn't really necessarily break. It's just a big surge. And they call these surging breakers. And we typically see these where you have uh, more significant waves that move into the shoreline with steep beaches. Notice how steep that that beach is there. Now, sometimes we can have beaches where, where they get steep if there's renourishment or some other things that go on. But this would be the type of wave that if you're standing there, it would probably knock you down and uh, you certainly would feel it uh, pulling you back out as, as the wave recedes back into the ocean. So it's, it's not all that common where we're at. The other one that um, we, we do get from time to time that I really want you to be mindful of is called the plunging breaker. So we have spilling, surging, and plunging. This is where the top of the wave moves much faster because it's very energetic. It's moving much faster than the base of the wave. And then when it feels the base of the wave feels the bottom, the top pitches over or plunges over. And it, that's when you have the air that gets caught in the tube and it crashes. They're loud. All the energy is released at once with this one. This is the one I want you to be careful about because if you're out here body surfing in this type of wave, trying to catch this wave, and you, you jump forward to catch the wave, and the wave, the, the top of it, actually takes your feet and flips it up over your head, it could push your head into the, into the sea floor, and then you can have a spinal injury. And we want to avoid that. You hear of these spinal in, injuries happening a lot in the Outer Banks, sometimes at our beaches here, and uh, they're, they're much more common when you have something like this. I guess the, the similar thing would be diving into a pool head first that's shallow. And we all know that's extremely dangerous. We never ever want to do that because if your head hits the bottom and your neck gets jarred the wrong way, 
then we can have um, a, a real dangerous situation. So be careful, you know, body surf the spilling breakers, but be extremely careful and, and, and I would avoid body surfing when you have plungers that are out there. So of the three waves, I already told you the answer, the plunging, the one on the right, is the one that would be, we have to be very careful with spinal injuries because this is what can happen. Your feet get pitched up and over and it forces your head down into the sand below, below the water. That hyperextension is what it's called. You've got to be careful. I can't stress it enough. All right. Who wants to take a shot at this one? There's two types of breaking waves in this picture. There's one right near the shoreline, and there's one where the surfers are surfing it in the back. Anybody want to tell me what two type of breakers we see? The one in the back first and the one in the front last. Jayla, have a go. Red kind. What type of waves? What, there's two types of waves. I, I think one's a plunging wave. Yep, the one in the front is a one plunger. The front is a plunger. The breaker is out back. And the one the guy's surfing on is a spilling breaker. So you can have different wave types. And I would be really careful getting out of the ocean at this point where you have the plungers as well. All right, real quick. As the waves come into the shoreline, that's the, break, that's the beginning of the surf zone, which is called the breaker zone. It's where the waves are breaking and they are dispersing their energy through the surf zone. So that's when we go, well, I'm going surfing. People stay in the surf zone where these waves are. The swash zone is the area where the water laps up onto the beach and goes back. And this surf zone can change depending on the tide. If it's a low tide, the surf zone's usually bigger. If it's a high tide, the waves are usually breaking right near the coastline. When we have a bigger surf zone, that's when we're more likely to see rip currents and that makes them dangerous because they can be a, a football field in length offshore. When you have waves coming in at an angle like we see to the beach here, that's when we get a longshore current develop. So if you're in the water, how many, how many times you've, you've gone to the beach, you get in in front of your parents and then five minutes later you look up and your parents are half a football field away, that's the longshore current because of waves coming in at an angle that push you and sweep you down the beach. Um, oftentimes we hear our lifeguards talking about missing people when there's a strong longshore current. It doesn't mean they're in danger, it's just that they got swept away down the beach and, and their parents lost sight of them. So this is very important for parents, is when you have strong longshore currents, keep an eye on your kids because they're gonna get swept down the beach quickly and you don't want to have your heart sink down into your stomach when, when you look up and you don't see them out there anymore. We, we, you gotta pay attention. 100% of the time when we're at the beach because there's just too many different hazards out there. It, these are very common around this area. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we get longshore currents a lot, and some could be fairly strong, especially by the, the, the late morning, afternoon frame, time frame. Waves coming in at an angle, and then the sea breeze winds are, are intense by that time, and it, they combine to create these strong currents. And when you have waves come in near normal, come directly on shore, we typically get the rip currents. And there's three parts to a rip current. There's the feeder parts, there's the neck. The neck part is, is where the speeds go through the surf zone that carry you away from the beach that can be faster than what an Olympic swimmer can swim at. And then beyond where the waves are breaking is called the head part. That's where the rip current disperses. If you know you're caught into a rip current and you have the energy to swim, now is the time to swim to the side one way or the other and head to the white water that you see, which is where the waves are breaking. And that where the white water is tells you where the sandbar is. If you can swim out of the neck of the rip current, you might be able to get into a spot where you might even be able to touch. You might not be able to, but in the least, if you get to that white water, you might be able to use the waves to come back in. If you're feeling tired and you're in this neck part, which is like a treadmill, you've got, a, you, you've got one or two things. You can try and swim off to the side, but if you're extremely tired, and you don't think you're gonna be able to swim much longer, you gotta use all your energy in staying afloat. The rip current will carry you out, and then as you're getting carried out, you know, wave for help, uh, call for help, but focus your energy on staying afloat. Rip currents don't pull you under. You go under as soon as you can't swim anymore. You know, they're not pulling at your feet, pulling you under uh, in a situation like that. 
So they can be faster than an Olympic swimmer can be. They're only about 30 feet wide. If you can swim 30 feet, you can swim out of a rip current, but they can be very long. The distance from the beach to the head could be the length of a football field sometimes. So think of them as treadmills. You want to get off the treadmill. You're never going to beat a treadmill. The treadmill is always going to win. Swim to the side to get off the treadmill. All right, rip currents are hard to identify by people who aren't used to looking at the surf, all the visitors that we have. Um, if you go to the beach and don't pay attention, then you might miss these things. You can always talk to lifeguards there, but they're, they're dangerous because they're hard to identify by untrained people. They're encountered by people with no rip current experience whatsoever, people visiting from Ohio, Kentucky, never been in the ocean before, let alone know what a rip current is. And the worst events occur with the best weather. That storm is so far offshore that the weather is actually nice at the beach and people assume because the weather is nice that the ocean is gonna be nice. That's not always the case. People try to take the shortest route to get back to the beach and that means they stay on the treadmill and then they get tired and then they go under. They've gotta get off the treadmill. If you go to the beach and you can look from a high spot, you can see where the rip currents are, maybe as you're walking over the beach. They look muddy sometimes, like this picture in the top left, it looks like chocolate milk. It's actually sand and sediment being carried away from the beach by the rip current. You might actually see foam that the rip current carries back out from, from waves that are coming by. You might see a dark area between lighter areas. The lighter areas are the sandbar, shallower areas. The dark area, the sunlight can't reach the bottom and it, it's therefore it shows up darker and that's where the rip current could be. Areas where waves don't break. Areas that are moving into the sandbar are feeling the bottom and they're breaking. But if there's a deep spot between two sandbars, they're not feeling the bottom and they're not breaking. And it might look like a nice peaceful place to swim when it isn't. So it might be muddy or dirty. There could be foam or seaweed or it looks really choppy compared to other areas. It might look darker. Areas where waves don't break. So here's where I need your help. This is a picture of a rip current somewhere in here. White water indicates where waves are breaking on sandbars. The, where the waves aren't breaking could be a clue for you. It might look darker than surrounding areas. Anybody wanna take a shot of where the rip current is in this picture? And know that rip currents go through the surf. This is a really good picture, I like this one. Um, oh, it, gets, Scott, it, it gets better. Do you wanna give it a go or Cynthia or David? Oh, uh, Scott says A. Yes, good job, Scott. Yes, well done. And here it comes out all the way through the surf. Here's where the white water is. So if I'm swimming here and I see this white water, and if I can't touch bottom, then at least I'll be able to, I know I'm out of the treadmill that's going on here and I can use the waves to come back in. Very good. All right, I need someone to tell me where this rip current is. This should jump right out at you. Oh yeah. So I'm looking in the chat, we've got B. Yes, excellent, B. If this was me and I see this family oh, here, goodness, yes. I would be very uh, friendly, very kind, and just, just introduce myself, I'm Mr. Steve. I know I, I learned about rip currents and I'm really afraid um, that, um, that for your family because there's a rip current right in here. Here's how I can tell. Here's the sandbar on one side and the other and this rip current is right in here and I just want you to be safe. See how you can save someone's life potentially just by with some information that you know. And then you might make new friends out of the deal too. This is true. I, I'm wondering if any of our young scientists have been caught in a rip, rip current. You can leave that in the chat. Ah, this one here is a little different. Yes. Now, someone wants to take a shot at this one. This one's not easy, but I would look for muddy or chocolate milk type appearance compared to other areas that we see in this picture. Who wants to take a stab at this one? Uh, Jayla says C. So Excellent. This, yeah. Right, yep, right in here. And this was off Carolina Beach. Oh, wow. We have them anywhere there are breaking waves. Any beach that has breaking waves could have rip currents. And that includes the Great Lakes. Scott, I don't know if you can put your microphone on, but he said that he's actually been caught in a rip current in Japan. Oh, wow. And if it's Japan, then it's going to be an active coast. Right. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
I've helped countries with their rip current forecasting. I've helped South Korea. I've helped France. I've helped the Netherlands. I helped some of the Caribbean islands about how we do our forecasting and how we uh, provide rip current information. So, I mean, I, it's, like I said, you never know who you're going to meet and who you're going to help in, in your job. And I was fortunate enough to, to be able to work with other countries with this. And it looks like he got, he, he said Bahamas was worse. Is your microphone working, Scott? Yeah. So how'd you feel? So you've been caught in a couple of rip currents. Yeah. Actually, surprisingly, none here. And you, were you able to swim to the side or did someone have to rescue you? I was able to swim to the side. I swim pretty well. I am on a professional swim team. Good. So, yeah, and I was able to swim to the side. It was actually a quite narrow one, probably only around 10, 15 feet. So, yeah, that made it a little easier. Sometimes the narrow ones could be more intense too. Right, it was pretty intense. It was only carried about, not even like maybe half a football field. Okay, well, I'm glad you knew what to do because yeah. if you didn't, it might be a different situation, right? Yeah. Yeah, good deal. Well, help me as well as everybody on this this presentation. You know, help me teach other people. When you got friends and family come to visit in the summer, and you're going to the beach, it only takes five minutes to talk, to talk about rip currents. And there's a good rip current web page. Uh, that I can share with Dr. Rob to share with all of you. It's ripcurrents.noaa.gov. Right. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you have, have that link because it's got some great pictures too. And, and of course, you can share. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll also share you my presentation as a PDF that you can pass along to everybody. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Who wants to do this one? Areas where waves don't break. Cyrus, have a go. Well, the chat room says C. Yes, excellent. So A is probably a feeder into it, but the main rip current is through here. And the same thing with these people that are, that are here by the water, I would introduce myself and just be really nice and try and be helpful and just explain that there's a rip current right there. And you, you never know, these two might, might want to go swimming here and get caught in the rip current and there's barely anybody on the beach. And not all of our beaches have lifeguards. So that's another point too, is never go in the ocean alone and never go without something that you can, that you can uh, use to float on in case you get tired. And it might be a pool noodle. A $2 pool noodle might save your life. And it's very, very light. And everybody should have one at the beach as far as I'm concerned. I wish they would make everybody have something. If you're going to go in the water, you have to have something to float with um, if, if um, you're in these types of situations. will help greatly. So we've, we're going to talk about um, this one and then a couple other slides, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to finish up on what if you see someone caught in a rip current. So this one, we're looking down from the walkway over from this part of the beach. This one looks like a rough one. I, look, I see a real area uh, breaking through where the waves are coming in, and there's a lot of foam and churned up water. And it looks like there's even a head that I can see extending beyond where the waves are breaking. Um, this one is a frightening one, actually. This is probably a very powerful rip current. Anyone want to tell me where this one is? Anyone can just unmute their microphone and answer this one. Gayla says A. Yes, excellent, A, that's where it's at. B is where the sandbar is. There's also a sandbar over here, and C is probably the feeder, one on each side coming in into this thing. You guys have done, phenomenal with these. This is the, 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 the message that we have. It's called break the grip of the rip and shows you how to escape. And the, the best case is to swim to the side as soon as you know you're in a rip current. But if you can't stay afloat, wave for help. And so hopefully someone can come get to you or you can rest up and get some energy and then swim back in. It's going to be a farther swim in the, the, the longer that you wait. Uh, but you not you need to know your options, and we'll talk about if you see someone here in a second. But let's pretend we're in the water. This is Dave Baker. He got in the water for us. He's he's the the head of Wrightsville Beach Ocean Rescue. He's a great friend of the the Weather Service, and um, he got in the water to pretend there was a rip current at this location. And talking with Dave, he said he's, he's talked a lot and he's met people that have been, he's rescued people, saved people's lives over the years, over the past 20 years. And he says that a lot of people say that they didn't even realize they were in a rip current. They didn't feel like they're getting carried away, but they were swimming to try and get back in. 
and realized that they weren't getting any closer. So the speed of their ability to swim was matching what the strength of the rip current was and they weren't getting any closer and they're just getting tired. Now, some very strong rip currents, you feel like you're being carried away and you know you're in trouble. But a lot of the times you might be just countering that treadmill just enough that you're staying in the same spot. So that's, um, it's not always obvious, uh, but if you, you're trying to swim back in and you're putting a lot of effort into it and you realize you're not getting any closer, chances are you are in a rip current and now you need to know to swim to the side to take, to take action. All right. And I kind of talked about those things, the stronger ones. Yes. You'll feel like you're being pulled away. So, so let's pretend Mr. Dave is in a rip current. The question I have for one of you is what direction do you not want to swim? In this case, anyone, I would say B you, you don't yeah. want to go. You don't yeah, you're right. You're staying on the treadmill, right? Dr. Rob, you're, you're not getting off the treadmill if you go B. So you want to yeah. swim A. And JLS yeah. says the same. I mean, you're fighting yeah. the physics. That's what you're doing. Yes. You, you can swim out of a rip current, but you can't out swim one. I guarantee you that rip current will win all the time if you try and fight against it. All right. This, this last scenario I want to talk about. These two people, this is at Oak Island. This photo comes to us from the Wilmington Star News, our partners with the Star News. There is a big storm far off the coast. Swells are coming in. This is Oak Island. It's a beautiful day at the beach. It's a weekday. If it was a weekend, there'd be a lot more people there. But there is a bunch of rip currents in this picture. Here's one through here. Here's a real big one right in front of those people. Here's one that's narrow right here. You can see the dark spots all the way up and down. I love this picture. This picture and is the, awesome. And the surf zone, look how wide the surf zone is. Uh, the waves are breaking far out. So if you get caught in a rip current on a day like this, you're going for a ride way out if you don't know what to do. So let's pretend these two people go for a swim right about in here. They're at waist deep and they, they get, start getting pulled out by the rip current to location X. What is the worst direction to swim out of these four scenarios? They're thinking about it. They're thinking about it. Come on, Cyrus. You've got this. Well, B. B being the worst. So we've got one vote for B. Any B others? not a good way to go. I'll, it's not B's the worst, but it's the second worst, I would think. What is the worst, the absolute worst thing you could do? Is it D, Steve? Yeah, I don't want to be on that treadmill and fight against the treadmill. So D is the worst. It's going to get me tired the fastest. B is the second worst because if I ride that rip current out, it's just a long swim back in, and I don't want to be uh, out in the water in a dangerous situation any longer than I need to be. So I would swim A or C, swim to the side, get to the white water, and then use the white water to come back in or maybe even feel the bottom. But what happens if I go too far A or C in this example. What could possibly happen? Well, have a look at what's about 20 meters along, along the coast. There's a, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, I'm seeing other dark spots that are concerning if I swim too far. So I can get if, caught in another another rip current. In another rip current, right? Which yeah. may not be obvious if you're in the water. Yes, it wouldn't be obvious at, at all. I don't think it's real easy to look at this from above and make the determination. Uh, but that's why I say use the clues that are around you. You know, use the clues of where the where the white water is consistently breaking because that's that's going to show you where the sandbars are and at least to give you a chance to get back in. But these two people went swimming. Do they have flotation with them? Anything to hang on to? I don't see anything in their hands. Uh, so that puts them at more risk because if they get tired and can't do any of this, then they're gonna get tired after a while and then they're gonna go under. All right, last thing I wanna talk about real quick is you're at the beach, you see someone in the water, in distress, could be anything, but we'll say a, a rip current in this, in this case. If you are not trained and you go in the water, the situation could turn ugly. I know you want to do your best to help someone, 
to, to save someone's life. But if we're not careful what we do, we can be in a lot of danger to the person you're trying to get to and also to yourself. So if you see someone caught in a rip current, first thing you should do is get uh, a lifeguard or call someone one. Let them know what's going on. No, he's not. Where you're he's not at. talking. It's important to know where you're at, uh, so you can tell the police to the where or the EMTs to tell you uh, to find you quickly. If you can throw something, some sort of something that will float out to them, that's a good thing uh, too. Uh, that they might be able to swim to it and hang on to it if they they get tired. But if you absolutely have to go in the water to make a rescue. And I don't encourage this because you're not trained to. But if I had to go in the water to make a rescue, I would never go in the water without something to float onto myself. And that's where that pool noodle is important. A boogie board is important. Something. Because by the time I get out, so if I have to swim from the beach all the way out to location X or location B on this picture here, I'm going to be very tired by the time I get to that spot to get to them. The other thing is when someone is trying to keep their head over the water, it's like swimming with dogs. Dogs will just mow you down. They're just trying to swim. They're not, they don't know any, any better. They're not trying to avoid you. They're trying to swim to get to, to uh, dry land here. People's instinct to survive kicks in. When you're not getting air, you do whatever you can to get air in your lungs. And they're not purposefully trying to push you underwater. They're trying to use you to keep their head afloat. So a lot of times lifeguards have to, they always have something to float on because when they go out to their victim, the victims oftentimes try and pull them under, not because they're trying to be bad, but they're just fighting to stay alive and they can't control their thoughts of what they're doing. So that's what happens when we, when we have people that go swim and have no idea what to do about saving someone in the surf. They see someone in distress, they swim out to them, they get pushed under or they get tired because they have nothing to float on, they don't know what they're doing and they become the victim. And remember our data, our data shows that one in four people who drown in a rip current is that person trying to be the person, the good Samaritan, the bystander trying to help out as best they can. They're not trained to do it. So it, it's a very complex type of, of thing. It's very difficult for parents to watch their kids in harm's way and not do something. It's very important for parents to understand this message as well. Only go in the water if you have something that you can float with because you're going to get pulled under or you're going to get tired if you don't and you're going to become a victim of this. This is why rip currents are the number one reason in the Carolinas that, uh, that we have uh, at least the number one weather related killer in the Carolinas is rip currents. All like right. Throwing stuff into the water too is like because the water is moving it's like if someone yeah. falls over overboard of a boat right one of the first things that you do is throw stuff into the water. Yeah, you throw a life ring if, you, or right, something. A life, life jacket, jacket life ring, anything, something. Right, a cooler or whatever. Mm -hmm. because yes. It also allows you because to, to keep an eye on where they are in the water too, right? Yep. Because there's yep. lots of white. If, if someone is having, is trying to spot the person that's in trouble, right, it's a lot easier to see something that's floating on the top there with all the white wash and waves around the outside of it. So, yeah. Yeah, and it, it can be very frightening um, experience, just like going through a tornado event. I mean, it all can be frightening. I mean, it, that's why it's just best that we, we're, pre we're prepared mentally with knowledge. We're prepared at home uh, to, to keep ourselves safe. So if, it's, if it's a tornado or a hurricane, we're making smart decisions as best we can, and we're sharing information. I think those are the two most important things that I hope you take away from this, and, and including the individual things, is you guys can make a difference. Um, you, you apply what you learn and, and uh, you'll be surprised on who you can help. Cool. Um, is there any, any questions? We, I think we've got time for a, one question here. If anyone's got any questions at all, I, I'm going to ask one for you. What got you interested in meteorology? And I, 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 some of my earliest memories, I, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, as far as the first five years, six years of my life. Then we moved to the, the, the Jersey Shore, uh, the beach areas there in south, southern New Jersey. Uh, but I remember having a bike with training wheels when I was five years old. It was 1976, and there was a hurricane 
threatening the Jersey Shore and maybe even inland areas of New Jersey and Philadelphia. And I remember riding my bike up and down on the city blocks, uh, screaming at the top of my lungs that a hurricane was coming. Uh, so I think it started real young for me, just being able to tell people and inform people and be as helpful as I, as I could. But it was really the excitement of snowstorms and thunderstorms. Uh, you know, I was frightened of a lot of these things. And that, that fear turned into education for me. And the more I learned about it, it was in eighth grade when I realized uh, I had a teacher in eighth grade who, um, who you know, it, he had us do crazy things like do skits and things like that. One day he had us do a skit of where we had to put on a news production. So he assigned different roles and he pointed to me to be the weatherman or the meteorologist. So I had to go home, draw weather maps and then present it to uh, the group the next day. And then it was that point in my life where I'm like, this could be a career for me. I never, and I haven't looked back since. So I mean, weather was always an interest when I was young, but it didn't hit me until eighth grade that this yeah. was for me. Oh, that's awesome. And um, clearly it's something you're very passionate about. And uh, we're glad you're here in Wilmington serving the, the Cape. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and when all this stuff gets back to normal, man, I hope the group can come out and visit us. Oh, I, absolutely. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for your time today. Um, I know things are busy, and, but um, really appreciate everything that you spoke about today. Lots of really, really good information. And um, but yeah, thanks, thanks very much. So we, we typically unmute our microphones at this point and give a big round of applause. <laughs> that was... you're, you're welcome. I, I enjoyed it, obviously. I have a lot of fun. Yes. And Kids are great. Thanks, you guys so... are all great. Great questions, great answers to my questions. I'm really proud of all of you. Yeah. Well, well, thanks again and uh, stay safe and healthy and we'll see you on the flip side of this. All right. Take, take care. Stay safe, everybody. All right. Thanks.